Uh, as you see, we just had a poll launch shortly. If you jump in and you're, you've just joined us, make sure you take that poll. We're looking for information on your type of business, your economic advantage of your business, and also if you've done business with the Bureau of Reclamation before. My name is Lori Manning, and I am the State Director for the Idaho PTAC. Tiffany Scruggs, and also Dee, um, I'm sorry, there's, there's Tiffany, and where's Dee, can you wave at us? Dee Edwards, she is with the Oregon's PTAC. And we are all here today joining together to be able to bring you a presentation. I think at this time, we're gonna go ahead and get started. It looks like we have over 60 folks on the line with us. Um, and it is my job to get you hosted in and let you see a little bit about the PTAC and what we are and who we are so that you will have a better understanding of how we can assist you in your process of attempting to get a solicitation from the Bureau of Reclam Reclamation. So with that, um, Casey, if you don't mind, if you'll push us forward on the slides. Thank you. So as you can see, and I've got this poll, let me relaunch this poll out of the way. Poll, let me relaunch this poll out of the way. All right, as you can see, the, I am, the PTAC is the Procurement Technical Assistance Program, and each of us are called a center in our state, and that's why we are called PTACs. And basically, we help explain procurement bids, the things that the Business of Reclamation will put out for you. We're able to help decipher some of that information. We can help you develop your bid notices. We can help you understand those things review the bids and actually the paperwork, especially with the FAR, which is a federal acquisitions regulations to help you understand your process in doing business with the government. We all send out daily emails or custom emails that give you solicitation opportunities. Each of our programs is attempting to help you find or garner the best results for your business in government opportunities. We assist in getting you registered with the DUNS, and the SAM. It's very important that you have all of your registrations up to date and all of our counselors are skilled at being able to make sure you have what you need to be um, properly doing business with the government. We host statewide events and training similar to this one and oftentimes we combine with other PTACs just like Oregon and Washington has done on this particular event. So that Pacific Northwest, we're here offering a training on how to do business with the government in, in uh, business of reclamation or Bureau of Reclamation. So we're glad to have you join us on that. You know, one of the most important things that I think our PTAC does, and I know that Tiffany and Dee would agree, is helping you get your capability statement written out. That's basically a business calling card. So it is a one page resume, if you will, that allows you to be able to um, approach a government agency, let them see what you're capable of, offer references, and we help shape those to give you the best opportunity to obtain a government contract. We're glad to have you here. We're glad to be able to offer some of these items so that you understand what we can do in your state. On our original slide, you will find the email address of every one of our PTACs, the Idaho PTAC, the Washington PTAC, as well as the Oregon PTAC. Welcome to the Doing Business with the Bureau of Reclamation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to both Casey and Greg as they share with you some of the items necessary for uh, doing business. Thank you, and we look forward to visiting more with you. Hey, Lori, this is Tiffany. Just making sure that Casey is unmuted. I went ahead and muted him. Um, and so Casey, you'll have to unmute again on the Zoom platform. And just a reminder to all the attendees, if you do have a question, use the Q&A function. We'll have lots of time for question later yes. on in the presentation. And I'm already seeing quite a bit of chat and good morning. Good morning, Rosanna. Um, thank you for, for doing that for us. Um, and now we're, it looks like we're viewing Casey's slide deck again, and he is unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, when I do that share screen, I have to kind of get out of it just to, <laughs> just to do the unmute within the Zoom, but can everybody hear me good? We sure can, go ahead. Okay, awesome. Um, 
So again, thanks everybody for being here. Um, super excited about the turnout um, and excited that all the PTACs within the Pacific Northwest uh, could participate. They're an incredible resource. I can't stress that enough. Um, because a lot of times we have folks reach out to the contract specialists or contracting officers and uh, just bandwidth and a lot of other variables. Um, it's definitely better to go straight to the PTAC and, and let them walk you through the process. But um, I'll introduce myself in a few slides, but Greg, if you want to introduce yourself and then we'll also have uh, potentially Matt still joining the call. He's an Air Force veteran, but he's one of our senior contracting officers that does supplies and services. Anywhere from that $10,000 to $25,000 range, he has a ton of experience, but he also does uh, the larger supply and service acquisitions on top of that. So hopefully he'll be able to join. He's had kind of a crazy morning, but uh, Greg, if you just want to introduce yourself real quick. Uh, looks like he's not on at the moment. So go, go ahead and move forward, Casey. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so again, thanks for being here. Just kind of what we're going to cover. I'm not going to spend too much time on the PowerPoint because um, there's kind of a few uh, quick facts I like to tell folks uh, to try and help them be more successful. Um, when doing business with reclamation, we do a ton of different projects in a ton of different areas. Um, but again, this is just kind of what we're going to cover within this uh, introduction. What is BOR? Some of our projects, kind of how we procure it, our goals and, and things of that nature. Um, so again, I'm Casey Aldrich. I'm a procurement analyst with the Columbia Pacific Northwest region. I'm also the uh, appointed uh, small business specialist for the, for the region. Um, so the, these are my type of events. You know, my goal is to increase competition, let folks know what we're doing, uh, and truly try and um, be an advocate for small businesses and, and help them uh, in doing business with the government because it, it's a win-win for all of us. I was a former contract specialist. I did just over three years. A lot of it was aviation contracting experience with the Department of the Interior and U.S. Forest Service. So with DOI, it ranged from everything from project work, fire, search and rescue. And then with the Forest Service, it was mainly fire aviation contracting. And then with reclamation, I did a year and a half on the complex supplies and services team. And so that's where a lot of my experience comes from, the lessons learned, uh, things that I can pass just on things I saw as a contract specialist doing supplies and service. Um, I'm a former Coast Guard veteran, so shout out to any Coasties out there. And I just just went over 18 years of government service, so that was pretty, pretty neat. Um, so again, just a background on reclamation. Um, Columbia Pacific Northwest region is mainly Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and just small parts of Wyoming and Montana. Um, I have over 120 reservoirs and dams, provide a lot of water to a lot of folks, um, provide a lot of the power to the Pacific Northwest, um, and then just to name a few of the power plants. Um, so what do we normally buy? So there's base work. I kind of break it down more supplies and services and then construction. Um, but some of the base work, pest control, weed spraying, janitorial, um, a lot of equipment repair, HVAC and maintenance, a lot of uh, kind of industrial equipment, skidsters, backhoes, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of project work, uh, peer reviews, lab testing, surveying and mapping, um, oftentimes engineering services. Um, there's turbine runner repairs. You know, a lot of our dams and power plants are aging, so that, that requires a ton of maintenance on our behalf. So 
Um, we do we do a lot of repair acquisitions. Um, so some of the frequently used NAICS codes, again, other heavy and civil engineering construction, electrical power distribution, engineering services. Uh, on the supplies and services, like I said, it, it's um, janitorial, weed spring, um, skidsters, backhoes, uh, tractors, um, things of that nature. So as far as what is our process and where do we post, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, but basically now, the, the two areas, so there's GSA Advantage, so if you have a GSA schedule, oftentimes um, if there's a schedule that meets our needs, GSA is one of the options we're supposed to use. And so within GSA, there's um, a solicitation that's posted and you respond uh, through GSA. And then uh, things that aren't going through GSA go to beta.sam.gov. And that's where all of our solicitations are posted and competed. So one thing I want to cover, I don't know how many of you have seen or interacted with the GSA gateway. So one thing I want to stress, the gateway is purely a forecast tool. Um, so if we have a project and it's in the planning stage, we'll put it in the gateway just to let folks know, hey, this is on the horizon. Usually we'll try and pick a quarter and what fiscal year it'll be in. But I get so many emails saying, hey, here's, here's my quote, or hey, I want to do this. But it's not a solicitation. It's truly just um, to try and be transparent, let folks plan and let them know to get it on their radar and maybe start putting together uh, the package so that when it does post to beta.sam.gov, um, you've kind of already had a heads up, you've already been working on it. And again, just because it's on the forecast, it might get bumped to the next fiscal year, it might get canceled, the needs can change, the requirements can change. So again, the gateway is not the official um, site that gets it. It's purely a forecast tool uh, to try and let folks know what we're doing and, and when we're thinking we're gonna do it. So just, just remember if you see it on the gateway, don't send in pricing, don't send in any of that stuff. Um, just start getting your package ready and, and watch and beta.sam for the official solicitation to come out. So how do we acquire goods and services under 25K? Um, goes to small business, uh, three vendors and quotes are submitted with every package over 10,000. So if Greg or when Greg's on, He's going to cover that, they call it the micro purchase uh, thresholds of 2,500 and 10,000, depending on if it's services or supplies, and kind of go through that process. But that 10,000 to 25,000 uh, allows or gives us the ability to do verbal quotes um, and things like that. So when you all send me capability statements, if I have a CO or a CS saying, hey, you know, I'm looking to do this in the Boise area. Has anybody reached out? That's kind of a good way to, to get on the radar. Um, but again, you still must be registered in SAM and be able to use IPP, which is our invoicing system. And instructions for IPP will be within the solicitation on how to get set up and, and things like that to submit. Um, to submit your invoices. Again, I'm consulted a lot of times about who can do what and where. So again, sending me your capability statement is is just a, a great way to get some exposure. Um, and it was just recent that the micro purchase, it's been about a year now. Um, so we expect some changes with that. Um, just more stuff on our forecast. There's the GSA gateway. Roughly about two billion combined over the next between last year, this year, and next year, FY 2021-22. And then you can also do Google BOR doing business with us. 
Now it'll take you to the main BOR page, and there should be a link to the GSA forecast. Um, again, it's, it's a great resource, but that is not um, the official area where solicitations will be posted. Everything's either through GSA or on beta.sam. Um, so last year, the small business goals you'll see. So the Department of the Interior set small business goals for all the bureaus and agencies within DOI. Um, again, I was super pleased with the amount of market research our CSs and COs did uh, through the year. We ended up uh, exceeding the majority of our small business goals. Um, hub zone in the Pacific Northwest is, is a little tougher of an area um, to accomplish, but in every other area, women-owned, uh, service-disabled, total small business, uh, we did really well. And, and again, through our market research process, um, that's where we're able to maximize that small business participation. Um, so kind of what do I want you to know? Use your your SBA and PTAX con connections. Persistence works. You know, obviously, the more you respond to the solicitations, it increases your chances. Um, and then a lot of these I'll kind of cover in in my quick list here in a minute. So uh, I'll just leave that up for a second for you folks to read read over that. Um, then what I can do to help, um, again, we'll kind of go through this when we open it up for the Q&A. And uh, here is my contact information. Right now, phone, because um, we're obviously not in the office with the, the pandemic and all of the interesting things it's brought on. So I would recommend reaching out to me by email. I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, I'll just leave this up for a few seconds so you can at least just write down my, my contact information. Great, thank you. So it um, should have stopped. Yep, we went ahead and stopped that screen share, Casey, so that you'd have better access to the Q&A. And now Lori's just gonna put up that main slide again for the attendees. Um, so I'm Tiffany Scroggs, I'm the Washington okay. PTAC, and I'm helping out behind the scenes here. So I do have a series of questions here for Casey and Greg. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Casey, you mentioned um, the role that GSA has. Can you explain the difference between the GSA Gateway, GSA Advantage, and the role of Beta SAM? Yeah, so the GSA Gateway, again, is purely just a forecasting tool. There's, there's no responses needed. Again, it's just the, it's actually, it's mandated for all Department of the Interior. And it's just us saying, hey, these are the projects that may or may not happen, um, kind of get ready. So GSA Advantage, um, through GSA, there are different schedules for different supplies and services. So within GSA, if you're set up within GSA, they have different schedules, which means the government has already negotiated the pricing. They've already found it fair and reasonable. And again, within the FAR, it says if we can acquire it through GSA Advantage, we're supposed to. Um, so getting a GSA schedule and getting within GSA Advantage is uh, a great move on behalf of, of most folks. And so generally in the process, again, based on the FAR, so say I get a project. There, there's a certain checklist I almost have to go through. I gotta check Ability One, I gotta check Unicor, um, kind of, they call them mandatory sources. I'll check GSA Gateway. And if I can't find what we're looking for within any of those sites, that's when it gets to beta.sam.gov. And I would say as unique as the, the supply services and construction projects we do, 
I'd say there's still a large majority of our solicitations that hit beta.sam.gov. So that's where I always point people, but Again, GSA Advantage, if you can get on a schedule and, and submit all the required things for that, it kind of just doubles your chances or allows you to see acquisitions that might not ever hit beta.sam um, and, and kind of, it's kind of interesting. A lot of people think it speeds up the process, but we still have to follow the same steps even within GSA, we basically post a solicitation within GSA. Folks can respond directly within GSA. And so it's a similar process, just, just a little different, but hopefully that clarifies um, each of the three systems. Yeah, that is helpful, Casey. And just for the, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're unfamiliar with GSA schedule and getting on GSA schedule, it's quite the process and, and our PTAC programs across the states can certainly um, provide technical assistance on, on how to get on there, the eligibility requirements and the process. Um, it, it, and so if anyone's interested in learning more about that. Um, and you mentioned a couple of, of terms that might be new to some folks in our audience, Ability One, and Unicor, do you mind, um, do you want me to cover real quick what those are? <clears throat> yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so the, uh, just for, he's talking about his required sources of supply. So when he, before he goes out to bid to all of you, he has to make sure that the Ability One program cannot provide that service. And Ability One contractors are typically not-for-profit organizations that employ people with disabilities. And the second one is Unicor, which is uh, prison industries. So some of our prisons make goods and services that are available to the agencies to buy. So he checks those two places first before he goes out and gets what he needs from, from commercial entities like who we have on the call today. Um, so the next question, um, so Beth, I hope that, that helped you answer that one. The next question is a little bit more about um, the use of indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts for services. Um, Daniel indicates that he's noticed more standalone procurements compared to other agencies like Bureau of Land Management or the National Park Service. So do you use IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts, Casey? We do, but I would say he's correct. It, it seems like we do it a little less than other agencies, and I think it's just because of the variety of supplies, services, each area brings new challenges. You know, like I know in aviation, um, I did the on-call small program, which was the Type 3 helicopters, and yeah, we had an IDIQ with 52 different contractors, and it's because we were just requesting the same service over and over and over. We just needed helicopters to, to fly for us. And I think with reclamation, I always tease because usually when you go to a new agency, everybody's like, oh, well, we do it different. And you're like, yeah, whatever. I hear this at every agency I go to. But I would say Bureau of Reclamation truly does things differently. And um, yeah, we do some IDIQs, but I, I would say, uh, they're correct. A large majority of ours are uh, standalone, start from scratch, new projects. Okay, great. And on the theme of how you buy, is there a, a particular industry code or North American classification system, NAICS code, that um, you would always use GSA Advantage for or you're more likely to go to the schedules to use? Um, I would say if it's just I, I kind of want to say more basic things, like sometimes the industrial equipment, like a backhoe or a skid steer, sometimes you can find it on a GSA schedule. Services are a little trickier, um, but I, I would say supplies, you probably have better luck on the GSA schedule, whereas services get a little tougher. And, and again, reclamation is, is kind of unique, and we do a lot of business in a lot of small rural areas um, so through GSA a lot of times there's just not the capabilities uh, to do that. Very good. Uh, earlier you mentioned about hub zone historically underutilized business zone goals. The federal goal is three percent. Can you talk a little bit about 
um, that goal for your agency, the use of sources sought. Um, and lastly, if you're, if you're hitting your goal for engineering and environmental services. Um, would it be engineering and environmental services within hub zone or just in general? Well, yeah, I guess you don't have a hub zone goal for each industry, right? It's, it's agency wide. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, hub zone, if you pull up the Pacific Northwest, there's just not a lot of areas. We do market research as good as we can um, to try and identify those areas. But yeah, again, just within the Pacific Northwest, there's not a lot of um, hub zone opportunities. If they arise, we definitely consider them. Uh, again, it's just areas that are designated as hub zones. Um, it's, it's just a little, little tougher in our area. Understand that. And if firms are interested to know if they're in a hub zone, you might have, um, you can go to the Small Business Administration website and there's a map for hub zone areas. And then if you employ people over 35% of your payroll uh, is on hub zone, then you, you potentially could be eligible and your PTAC can help you walk through that if you, if you have any further questions. Thank you for that. Uh, we got a question from Matt. It says, if we have an innovative service that other agencies are using that you might not be familiar with, how do we share the details of this so you can assess it for its application within reclamation? Or how do we get those to you so you should consider it at the end user level? Um, I would say you could share it with me and then I usually try and find the department or kind of the SMEs uh, that are in charge of that. Again, it's it's good for market research and it's good for education purposes. Um, it's just unique because, um, again, until a solicitation posts or, or the requirements are set, things like that. But yeah, I think that's one of the reasons I provide my contact information. I do keep them all on file um, and share them with uh, both the acquisition staff and the SMEs uh, because Initially, any time a project started after funding is uh, obtained, the customer's the initial market research because they know their area, they know the project, they know it better than anybody. So the customer actually conducts their market research and then once acquisition gets the package, then, then we have the steps we need to go through. Very good. And can you talk a little bit about when it gets to you, how you decide if it's set aside, small business or 8A or any of the other socioeconomic programs? Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting within, you know, not to go too far into the federal acquisition regulations, but within part 19 of, of the FAR, um, it discusses um, projects under the simplified acquisition threshold, which is 250,000, and then uh, it talks about them um, above 250,000. And again, I think a lot of times people think um, that there's kind of an order of precedence or somebody's more important than the other. There's truly not. Um, we look at all socioeconomic programs equally. The SBA does have a list for women-owned small businesses and specific NAICS codes um, that we do have to address. The biggest thing when it comes to this is um, through the market research, we have to know that we're going to get at least two qualifying quotes um, in order to set something aside. So you look initially at the socioeconomic, so say you do a a source of thought or something like that, a, a market research tool, and you get responses from zero women-owned, but maybe five service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses. At that point, you could say, okay, I feel confident enough. I can set it aside for this socioeconomic group. And then, um, so you put it out and you get one from every socioeconomic group. That's where they might just say, hey, I don't feel confident that I'm going to get two or more, so I'm going to do a total small business set aside. And again, everything we do, the total 
is, is truly the baseline. Like if we go outside of the total small business set aside, we have to get permission both um, from Denver for certain dollar amounts and addition to the SBA PCR, which is our uh, procurement center representative. Uh, she's out of Portland. Um, but that's kind of the process is making sure, you know, the, the FAR says, two or more quotes. That's kind of the, the golden rule. And so again, just to stress the importance, um, when we put out a source of thought or a request for information, it is so, so, so worth your time. Say you're a woman-owned small business or any of the socioeconomic programs, um, it is so important to respond to those because that's us reaching out to the industry and saying, okay, here's what we have. Um, do you think you can do it? And if, again, if we get responses, say the NAICS code is on the woman owned small business NAICS code, and we get four responses of, hey, we do business in that area, um, we're going to respond to the solicitation, then, then odds are it's going to be set aside for a women owned small business. Great. Thank you, Casey. Um, this question is for Greg. So um, Casey already mentioned the simplified acquisition threshold. I'm hoping Greg can talk a little bit about the direct purchasing on a credit card type buys and when when does that happen? How does it happen? And how how does the agency find vendors to buy from? Greg, are you unmuted? Perfect. Thanks. Hi, Tiffany. Yes, I can talk to that very quickly. Um, so we have 200 and about 50 individuals here in the Bureau of Reclamation in the Pacific Northwest region who have government purchase cards. Um, and we have them anywhere from Jackson Lake Dam up in the Teton National Forest to Green Springs Power Plant in the middle of Nowheresville, Oregon. Um, because we have to maintain our power plants and our facilities, these cardholders out there are actively looking a lot of times to buy maintenance items, to buy parts for the tractors, parts for the, the little things, all the way up to $10,000. Um, and they're actively going online, they're talking to each other, they're talking to their supervisors, they're talking to the area offices um, to find out which the other organizations are, or w who other in their organizations have been buying this kind of stuff before. Um, so that's why I encourage everyone who would like to get on this to go ahead and do your capability statement and send them to Casey. I have access to that stuff and I will push them out to the card holders, um, to project managers, all the people who reach out to me asking if I have vendors already. Um, so that's stuff that we have to look for. Um, under that $10,000 limit, um, we also have the $2,500 limit for um, services. And that is service dependent and it is required by the Department of Labor. So it's not 100% something I have control over, but I work with the cardholders and with you, the contractors, when I need to, um, to find out what the Department of Labor requirements are and to see if we can pay for that on a purchase card under $2,500 or if we have to push it to a major contract in which acquisitions gets involved for those services over $2,500. Great, excellent. Thank you, Greg. Um, Casey, I'll turn it back over to you for a few main topics you continue to cover. Tiffany, I have one more. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry Greg, about that when... Sorry, um, Greg. I interrupted for, Greg, go ahead. For those of you who um, offer supplies, if you also offer them on, if you've partnered with Amazon um, as a seller, we have the ability through Amazon to delineate only to small businesses 
And that's something that we push also in order to keep up with the 3% um, required small business. So if you have an active Amazon sellers profile, make sure that you've worked with the SBA to get your verification as service disabled owned small business, women owned small business, um, economically disadvantaged small business, all those breakdowns that we would be looking for are available on Amazon if you've worked through the SBA to get that requirement. And we can also um, do the same thing through Amazon and be looking for your, um, your small business via Amazon. Thank you, Greg. Casey. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that, Tiffany. There's just a few things, um, again, and we can get right back to the to the Q&A, but again, we're, uh, I came from supplies and services, and um, there's just a few continuous things I kept seeing and seeing, so I like to, to go through them. Um, so they deal a lot with the market research process, the solicitation and responding to the solicitation. Um, but again, I'll just run through these and they'll probably bring up some more questions. Um, but one of the first things, so capability statement match the performance work statement. Um, so a lot of times, so the performance work statement is within the solicitation for services. And a lot of times we'll list a lot of different areas of the performance work statement. And then folks will just send us a trifold and that's their capability statement. But within a solicitation, I'm sure as the PTACs know, um, the capability statement should address each of the topics within the performance work statement. So if it's a janitorial contract and you send me a trifold that says, we do staffing, we do weed spraying, we do this, this, and this, it doesn't, it doesn't really address the performance work statement. The key is to address the performance work statement and tell us your technical approach or how you're going to meet those, those different needs. Um, another one is after a solicitation post, um, the contracting officers and contracting specialists get a ton of information about the previous contract. What was the pricing? Who did it get awarded to? Um, that's all public record. So just a, a quick search within beta.sam.gov um, will provide all of that historical information. Because a lot of times, um, again, just based on bandwidth, they may not respond. But I just want everybody to know, previous contract, the pricing, the vendor, that's all public information. And a, a quick search on beta.sam will, will provide that to you. Um, again, responding to the request for information and in sources sought is critical. That's one of the major kind of gold standard pieces of market research we do. That's the industry telling us, yes, we do it, no, we don't, or we can do it, or no, we can't. Um, so please, please, please respond to those. Um, this one sounds basic, and the next few people will, will laugh, but please re read the solicitation. There's no trickery in it. We tell you, hey, in order to be responsive, we need you to respond with your technical approach, past performance, uh, you know, contact information, those type of things. Um, so it's all spelled out right within the solicitation because if you fail to provide one of those um, items, and again, it'll change for each acquisition, but if you fail to provide one of those items, you're considered unresponsive and your quote might, might not get reviewed. And then in addition to reading the solicitation, please don't copy and paste. Um, we get so many responses to solicitations and, and we're talking half a million dollar solicitations where folks won't even read through their quote and it'll be for a different agency or a different date or a different service even. Um, so again, please just take the time to, to go through it. Um, attend site visits. Again, a crucial part. Site visits are, are, are done to show you kind of live what we're looking for or what's needed. 
Um, so they're crucial. And it doesn't matter if it's a turbine runner repair or janitorial contract, any of those things. Um, again, please, please uh, attend those site visits. Um, and then just, again, kind of the attention to detail. Please provide accurate pricing and make sure you even include pricing. <laughs> again, we get we get quotes where people will respond and pretty much have all that information and not provide pricing. And again, if 15 people respond and, and pricing isn't there, it can be considered an unresponsive uh, quote. So yeah, that was just kind of a few of the the things I saw and that I like to go over with people because I feel like those are more real world examples. And again, there's probably a lot of people out there laughing, um, but it happens a ton. Like you'd be shocked at how often it happens for things. Um, but yeah, that that's it on that front. Great, thank you, Casey. That's helpful. Um, can can you clarify one thing that you said? Beth is asking about a capability statement that addresses all the services that the company can provide. Um, you had mentioned the capability statement should match the performance work statement. Is that in the event of an RFI or source of sod, or can you talk a little bit more about that? That would be directly to the solicitation. So an example of this would be. Say your company provides a lot of different services, janitorial, staffing, payroll, all of those things. If we send out a solicitation for janitorial at one of the power plants, and it might be four different levels, it's industrial areas, it's all of these type of things. And, and usually within the performance work statement, there's kind of the, they call it the QASP, the Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan, I think it is. Basically, the uh, the system will use to check to ensure services are, are being done properly. So if we come out with a solicitation for one of the power plants and it says, you know, bathrooms need to be done twice a week, um, power plant once a week, et cetera, windows on this, and we just get a trifold pamphlet that says, hey, we do HR, hey, we do staffing, we do payroll, and oh yeah, we clean buildings too. Uh, just it doesn't really address the technical aspects of the solicitation, and, and again, it just kind of seems like a rush process where um, the technical approach needs to be clear um, and and address the needs that we're soliciting for. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think that's great. Okay, we have a couple of rapid fire yes no questions. So yes or no, does Bureau of Reclamation utilize 8A for construction? Uh, Greg can piggyback on this, but I would say yes. All right, Greg, do you want to piggyback? And you can elaborate on your answer <laughs> if you want. No, that's correct. The BOR mm -hmm. does use utilize 8A for construction. Um, uh, not for the purchase card. With the purchase card, construction is limited to $2,000. Good to know. Otherwise, it goes up to 10,000, like you said earlier, right, Greg? For supplies. Mm -hmm. For supplies. Up Perfect. to 10,000, yes. Excellent. Yep. And, and the 8A system, uh, that's in partnership with the SBA. Um, so there's, there's a few people involved with an 8A acquisition. Very good. Does Bureau of Reclamation utilize Fed Connect as many other Department of Interior bureaus do? So again, and I'll, I'll ask Greg to piggyback again. I know before when a solicitation would post, it would pose both to FedConnect and um, beta.sam.gov, but I think it might start getting limited to purely beta.sam.gov. Um, I, I had heard the FedConnect option might, might not be going on. Have you heard any more on that, Greg? No, I haven't heard anything. Okay. So yeah, I, I would say I know prior to it used to, but beta.sam.gov is definitely uh, the best source. And I, I did leave the link to FedConnect in the chat for people if you wanted to check it out. Um, 
for the other agencies that might be using it. Um, it's not a .gov, which tends to throw folks off. So I left the official link down in the chat. Okay, getting through these questions here. Um, you mentioned in one of your slides that the best way to gain business with reclamation might be to work with reclamation prime contractors. Do you have a list of primes? Um, I don't. Um, we don't usually, are you saying like to become a sub? Correct. Is that, is that what the question is? Or? Yeah, we usually don't get involved with that. It's usually we put out the solicitation, um, the prime will uh, respond and the subcontracting and things like that. The only time we get involved is um, within the solicitation, there might be some subcontracting goals that must be met in order to respond to the solicitation. But yeah, that uh, relationship between prime and sub, we're, we're generally not involved with it. Excellent. And, and PTAC can help a, a company figure out who the primes are using what we call market research. We can look in the databases to find out who you've awarded to Casey in the past and how to contact them. Uh, does Bureau of Reclamation utilize Indian preference for contracting with native prime contractors? I would have to review the regulation. I, I want to say that um, BIA is one of the agencies that's required, um, but I, I, I could be off on that because, um, you know, I know we get uh, asked the question question with each acquisition, but I think BIA with them, it is a required source where with other agencies, I don't believe it is. But I, I would need to further research that or look at um, part 19 of the FAR, but pretty sure BIA is the main agency where it's an actual required source. Great, thank you, Casey. And within the PTAC network, there are um, Native American PTACs that are specifically designed to help tribally owned firms and Native American owned firms. Um, and they have that Indian preference program memorized inside and out. Um, and so they, they'd be happy to, to talk with you as well. So thank you, Brian, for that question. All right, this one's a tough one, Casey. I'm gonna throw it at you here. Jeff is asking the, about the limitation okay. on subcontracting. Is it true that the limit on subcontracting rules do not apply to contracts that are valued under the simplified acquisition threshold of 250,000? Um, I would have to look that one up, but I want to say um, I might do a little clicking in the background, but for some reason I want to say within one of our forms, it might even be under um, 700,000. Do you know the limit on that one, Greg? I'm trying to look it up right now because that's not something that I'm a specialist in. And I know that the regs for okay. limitations, so they've monkeyed with them recently. Congress has changed around the limitations. So yeah, we, I think uh, if you guys can't find it quickly, we'll just follow up with Jeff later one-on-one -on -one. Uh, with the answer from you guys. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I know like on our small business form, there there's questions regarding that. And there is a certain dollar limit where a subcontracting plan doesn't, doesn't apply. Because I know in supplies and services, a lot of times subcontracting plans don't apply, um, especially if you're doing a small business set aside. Um, the subcontracting plan might not apply. Yeah, and just for people who might be new, um, when when Casey's agency has a contract that's let, um, it might have limitations on what can be subcontracted out and what needs to be performed by the prime contractor. Um, and so you wanna make sure you just pay attention to those clauses in the terms and conditions so you don't get yourself in trouble later. Uh, so we'll come back to that one if, if we can. If not, we'll do it offline. Uh, let's see, um, Steve asks, has COVID affected your forecast for service-based contracts? Um, and he's specifically talking about using staffing agencies to supplement staffing shortages that might have arose, or how has COVID impacted your agency? 
I would say staffing wise, not not much. Luckily, we do have the virtual capabilities or the operational folks that needed to be there. There was precautions put in place. I would say the biggest thing I saw, and I'm sure Greg even saw it with the purchase card, uh, there was a lot of emergency supplies and services uh, purchases, whether it might be um, hand sanitizers or emergency janitorial cleaning services or more frequent services. Uh, but as far as our actual staffing, uh, we weren't impacted very much. It was just some of the emergency PPE, those type of things um, that kind of popped up throughout the COVID. But overall, staffing and, and manpower-wise, we've actually done pretty well and are fortunate with the virtual capabilities. We've had to get creative, like they'll record site visits now and post them. And um, so I, I think it's definitely educated us on how capable we truly are. Uh, so that's been pretty cool, but yeah, I'd say the majority COVID related was um, emergency supplies or services that had to get acquired. Excellent. Thank you for that, Casey. Um, yeah, one last question on GSA, uh, larger construction projects, those uh, get posted to betasam.gov, correct? You do not use GSA schedules for construction. Correct. Yeah, they'll all go to beta.sam, the most complex projects. Okay, very good. And um, the nice thing about beta.sam.gov is that businesses can, can register in that system and be notified of opportunities that might come up that are relevant to their industry codes or any search criteria that they put into the system. Um, and they can flag notifications for specific solicitations and add themselves as interested vendors and do all sorts of things in that system. And if they get stuck, their PTAC can help them walk through it. Um, with that, Casey, I'm gonna turn it back over to you with any last thoughts that you and Greg might have for the 80 or so folks who joined us today. Um, so I was able, again, this isn't, doctrine, but I, I pulled up our, one of our small business forms. And so it's, um, it looks like Greg's sending me something to um, Greg, where I'm kind of discussing that, would you want to pull that up? But I, like within ours, uh, so it asks a series of three questions. Is it over 700,000 or 1.5 million for construction? Is the acquisition open market? which means it's not coming through an established source, and is the acquisition unrestricted, which means not being set aside for a small business. Um, and then it says if the answers of those are all yes, then the sub subcontracting plan and the DOI goals come in effect. So again, um, it looks like Greg might have found the actual guidance on it. Would you be able to piggyback on that, Greg? Casey, that's pretty much exactly what you said. It's uh, you can look it up in the federal okay. acquisition um, 19.702, where any solicitation, whether it's a sealed bid contract or not, um, over 750,000 requires a subcontract, uh, some contract, subcontracting plan. Sorry, I'm tripping over my tongue here. Um, below that, it does not require the mandatory subcontracting plan. Great, thank you. And yeah, I, and I, I don't know how many folks, oh, I, I was just going to say, I don't know how many folks in this group are small businesses, and I'm probably partial as the small business guy, but part 19 is incredible. It's one of the shorter parts, but it kind of goes through all of the small business um, set-aside requirements, subcontracting requirements, the relationship, with the agency and the SBA. Um, but part 19, if you're a small business, is, is a really great resource and a pretty quick read as to um, how the process works and, and kind of what we use um, to go through the process. And I've, I've left a link to the acquisition.gov where the FAR clause can be found for 19.702 um, in so folks can do some reading there as well. 
All right, Casey and Greg, last thoughts. Any last tips or anything you want people to know? No, um, I would say just again, feel free to reach out. I always keep your stuff on schedule and uh, or keep it um, all filed and and try and share it as much as possible. Please, please, please use the PTAC. Again, I can't stress the importance or how valuable of a resource they are because uh, it can be a little bit of a tricky process. And again, I know a lot of folks think um, there is kind of uh, tricks that are trying to be pulled, but usually within each solicitation, there's going to be um, a provision or a clause that says, hey, in order to be responsive, this this is what we're requiring. And it might be three bullets, it might be five bullets, but again, if you're struggling at all, just reach out to the PTAC. Um, you know, just, just researching previous acquisitions is a credible, an incredible tool and resource. Um, but again, I'm, I'm here, I'm an advocate. Um, you know, m my goal, again, it's a win-win for everybody to increase competition, to get the word out, um, and doing business uh, with each other. But what were you going to say, Greg? Yeah, just, um, I was just going to encourage everybody to reach out to Casey, reach out to your PTACs to, um, get your information to out to us and we'll continue to push it out. Um, almost everybody that I talk to is 100%. They will go to a small business over a large business, but they just have to know who those small businesses are that they can reach out to. Um, so just reach out, push us your capability statements and we'll continue to try to get as much business to small business as we can. Very good. Thank you so much for both of you taking the time today. Um, I know it's a very busy time for your agency and, and COVID has disrupted how we do business. So I think this was great. We, we had a great representation from the tri-state region. Um, I'll, for now, I'll turn it back over to Lori Manning from the Idaho PTAC. Uh, Lori, any last thoughts before you close us out? No, I'm just excited. We had so many participants today having folks join us to learn more about how to uh, be able to let their businesses uh, benefit from working with the Bureau of Reclamation. So thank you for joining us today. Tiffany, you did a great job with question and answering. Uh, we're excited to have everyone uh, be a part. Please reach out to your PTACs. On the screen, you should be able to see each of our websites. It's been placed in the chat. A recording will be available of this presentation. Uh, Tiffany will be sending those out probably by Monday uh, to each of you who are registered so that you can go back and see your favorite part and be able to gain more information. Again, we appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of what uh, the Bureau of Reclamation is seeking to do and, and let us help you with all of our free services through the PTACs. Have a great day, guys.